Wednesday nights to be together and just <coughs> worship him and be in his word, be in his presence, because he's real. You have to make him real in your life. If you believe it, you need to make him real in your life. That's what happens a lot of times. We say we love God, that we, we believe in him, but we don't make him real in our life. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad that you're here with us tonight. And I want to say that, I want to give you a little update. Um, we, we had our kickoff on Sunday for the Choices Walk for Life. And I want to say that um, as of today, we have had 12 walkers sign up. Isn't that awesome? 12 walkers. Thousand wow. dollars. So God is so good. That's only been a couple days. So I know that He has big plans, and this is going to be awesome. And if you haven't signed up, sign up because you're not going to want to miss out on this blessing. Mm -hmm. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'd love for you to text all your prayer requests to 407 490 4019. Again, the number is 407 490 4019. We'd love to pray for you. And we'd like to declare Psalm 91. So let's go to Psalm 91 so we can declare that together. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in Him I will trust. And surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste in the day. A thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high, because he has known my name. And he shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And now Pastor Shri is going to come forward and we will be blessed with the Bible study. Be blessed. Awesome. Separate bathrooms. <laughs> All right. Praise God for God is good. Amen. Amen. That is. Better and better. Yeah. Okay. I'm trying. Without spilling the water. So I'd like for us to go today into a a Bible study. Um. We finished the study of Lamentations, which is for us to have an inner cry. God's power is oftentimes released in such a way that when we need a difference be made around us, uh, it comes out of cry. So I'm now transitioning into our... Uh, uh, going after another uh, very important um, piece of a believer, um, which is I would like to go on studying the book of uh, Ephesians. That would be our uh, next uh, few weeks. That would be our study, the study on the book of Ephesians. Um, it's a, it has a very significance uh, in uh, particularly with the times that we are living in. It has a great significance in um, uh, knowing what it is and what it is not and how we can uh, utilize it and what is our role and what is it? 
what is it? You know, every time when we say, oh, we are the body of Christ, we are all, all we just go into the, uh, the auto motion because we have the notion that we are the body of Christ. But uh, <clears throat> many times I'd like for us to, um, many times, you know, we profess certain things and we don't have a full understanding or a good understanding of what we are professing. Particularly for me as a, uh, a person who grew up in a denominational church, there are a lot of confessions that are really good in the denomination. You know, when we uh, uh, grow up like uh, Nicene creeds or any of those creeds that are so um, useful or even every uh, Sunday you are required to uh, recite the uh, uh, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples uh, we are uh, 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 required to recite it and we would say it um, but um, for me personally for me there was no meaning to it there was no meaning to it there was no uh, connection to it in a similar way we do a lot of the things in the body of Christ uh, or in the uh, in the auto motion or a notion we just go keep saying things forgetting what it really means what it really means to us and uh, what are we drawing from it or what are we utilizing from it so uh, today I'm trying to make an attempt to study a little bit from the perspective both the book of Ephesians from the perspective of the body the body so that's why I titled this um, series to be the body and I encourage you uh, let's not rush this thing this is a very important uh, piece of information for us um, why I am saying is um, as much as it is important in the early church it is much more important for the ending church because when Jesus is coming back he's not coming back for the lost but he's coming back for his body He's coming back for his body. So it's important that when we understand what is uh, uh, our role um, our, uh, and what is our position, when we can understand those things, it allows us to uh, not only appreciate and uh, uh, also to uh, adopt and adapt to those things. While we are doing that, we would also be preparing uh, for what, what is to come. Uh, so, um, this letter or this epistle is one of the letters that Paul wrote while he was in the prison. He was in the prison in uh, Rome because he wanted uh, to have a hearing uh, with the Caesar, with Caesar. So he went to be in the prison and that's when he wrote particularly the four letters which are uh, uh, pretty much called as the uh, prison uh, epistles. And uh, four of them, four important people, uh, four uh, disciples would carry it or deliver it to the church there. When this is written for Ephesus, it was uh, the, the, the messenger that took the message was Tychicus. Tychicus is the one that uh, carries this message to that, uh, to that church. And I want you to also understand that is evangelism then. You know, evangelist comes from somebody who declares the message. Who goes into the public squares. And like, I mean, like you see that every now and then. These days, evangelism is coming more into the church. But evangelism is for the public squares. And that is one of the things that we have to understand why it is important for us to have or even defend uh, the, free, the freedom of speech. It is because we have to be in the public square. And I believe the awakening that is to come into this nation is going to happen in the public square. In the public square because everything has to be in there. Everything, the drawing force and debate and argument and uh, uh, presentation will be happening in the public square not as we are used to but in a different way you know maybe sometimes it is important you know particularly you know when we are going through 
a, a, a new software or new updates or stuff like that, we are required to shut down. We are required to shut down. I think the body of Christ needs to go through a shutdown. Because we are carrying the old stuff too much. We are carrying the old stuff too much that you are not preparing for what is to come. So uh, m many times I think um, Liz is not here, so I'm going to pick on her. <laughs> uh, well, she's doing good, good work out there teaching the young girls. But um, one of the beefs me and uh, Liz has is that uh, uh, she doesn't do uh, her phone. Oh, my phone doesn't work. My phone doesn't work. Give, it, give your phone to me. I ask her, give your phone. Well, as soon as I see her, I can tell two things she doesn't do. She doesn't do is one, uh, uh, she doesn't clear her history, one. And two, she never updates her system. <laughs> and she expects the machine to somehow miraculously work. Uh, uh, you know, what happens when you do an update on that machine? Any machine that you have, when you do an update on that machine, what does it go through? Immediately it has to go through a shutdown. You call it a restart or whatnot, however it is, it has to go through a shutdown. Because what has come in, what the new thing that has come in, will help us restart and do the new things that it has been programmed to do. <clears throat> the same thing is true for us as church, as the body of Christ, when we don't adapt to these things, when God is giving us information, we don't want to say, oh, I used to do this. I am, I am like this. Don't, don't try to water down the gospel. Water down what God is trying to give to us. This is very important. Many times we do that unknowingly because we take it too casual. We, 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 we try to deal with it in such a way as if, uh, um, if you're getting information from a classroom. You know, I can tell, I know very well, when I was in a classroom as a student, I, 70, uh, I can tell 75% of the time, I was always mocking the lecturer. I was always making fun of him, look what he's saying. He can't even pronounce this word right, or he can't even say this right. He doesn't know what he is trying to tell, the math equation that he is trying to tell. That is not how it's going to work, it is going to work here. I, I always made a parade around, but uh, I can't afford to do that with the Word of God. Let me be very clear, Word of God is not for group discussion. Okay. Particularly when God is bringing, thus saith the Lord. Because your transformation, what you have to transform, is your accountability, not mine. So that is not up for a group discussion. Instead, it is for a personal conviction. So many times what happens is the word... You didn't even give room for it to convict because you, 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 you made it so common. You are not letting it go inside. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it so real for us today because so many of us are hearing the word and not getting the results that it brings. It's because you're too much, too much excited about saying amen than very excited about receiving it. Let it convict, let it plant, let it, let it be watered inside. Many times I'm going to tell you something. When you get excited about the word of God, I'll tell you one thing. 99% you fail the word. You fail the word. No doubt. Remember, the four grounds that Jesus talks about when the word was spoken, one of the grounds is an excited ground. It's a ground of excitement. The word was met with excitement. But because of that, it didn't take enough root. And it was easy for the enemy to steal from them. Amen. So instead, instead of responding to it with excitement, let's respond to it as a disciple. Disciple is not somebody who moves. You know, when you know you are in this for a long haul, you're not moving. You're absorbing. 
You're trying to grasp everything. That is what the disciples have done when Jesus was on this earth. He was, uh, they were observing him and absorbing from him. Amen. If we don't give an opportunity for the world to do that, even though it is the most powerful tool that you and me will come across, it will become of no use. And I even tell you one more thing. This is all in love and friendship. I even tell you something, when you get a revelation, shut up. <clears throat> Keep that revelation to you. Steady it. <clears throat> Let it become real in you. Let that revelation, whatever God spoke to you, oh my goodness, this is, no, you don't need that. First, let it steady you. Let it go, let it convict, let it show, let that light shine wherever there may be cracks, wherever there may be darknesses, so that it can bring forth the fruit. It can bring forth what it is sent for. We're not giving enough time for the word to reproduce. So I encourage you now, as a believer, the time right now is for reproduction. It's being able to bring forth the word. Bring forth the fruit of the word in a time for reproduction. Sounds a little odd, but that is what it is. And God expects us to replicate him, to be able to bring forth what he has. That's why he called us to bear much fruit, to bear much fruit. You know, I have seen I'm in all of my life, my, part of my family is farming family. I have never seen a tree yield fruit until it dug its roots. I have never seen that. How do you expect the word to bear fruit in us if we don't let it dig its roots? Let the seed dig its roots. When we are getting something, I think it is worth pondering. That's why Bible says, he who meditates on his word day and night is blessed. Amen. Meditate means take time to think. Take time to ponder. I used to do a big mistake as a kid. You know, as soon as I'm getting information, I would pass the information to somebody else. That, 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 that was a good thing, I felt. But the problem was, I'm not taking enough to absorb where it can reproduce and I'm able to replicate it. The moment I realize that I'm wasting my energy. So then I stop doing, stop doing that, but I started taking time. Let it come. Let me get to the bottom of it. When I can get the principle of this thing, I can teach many more. And so many of my friends got benefited because of that. Because I was able to absorb it. I used to play with them all the time when they are playing. I used to do all kinds of things that they are doing. But there was a time when they had to be tested. They always came around me. But when I have absorbed this information, I was able to help them better. The same thing here is so true. When you can absorb the word of God, when you do that, you'll be able to bring forth much fruit. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you, don't, don't, it is not about excitement. Word of God, nor the revelation is not about excitement. <clears throat> it is about transformation. You want transformation? Give it time. Give time for the formation. That's when you will have transformation. So now, um, the body of, of, of Christ is the emphasis of this uh, um, uh, book of Ephesians. So, but I, before I jump on it, I want to go through a few things that I believe are going to be very helpful because we see, uh, how, we all are aware of Great Commission, right? Jesus gave us a Great Commission in a minute. I'm going to study on that. I'd like to call that as delegation. He was delegating his job to us. All right? When, when delegation happens, uh, uh, if there is no authority, 
If you delegate some work to somebody and don't give them authority, they'll never bring back results. That's one thing. And then, other thing also is about the understanding of the position. If you don't give them an understanding, a comprehension of what is this position, particularly a new hire, they have to go through certain trainings and things like that. Why? This is a new position. They can't do what they were doing. We have been given a new position. So the same thing works here because we have been given a new position, which is the body. We are part of the body, amen? So we have been given, are we, we have been delegated by God to do certain things, go e into the world and preach this gospel. I'm going to study it in a minute. But the body of Christ has a delegation. We have been delegated. You know, many times we look at delegations as obligations. That's another problem. Christians, many times we look at our delegation, God-given delegation as an obligation. That's why we go to church as an obligation. But anyway, I'm, I'm, uh, 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 right now, as I was talking about, he, Paul wrote this letter while he was in a prison. Now look at this. Paul was talking about authority while he was in prison. Think about that. How, how contradicting it, it would look. You yourself cannot get yourself out of the prison, but you're talking about a believer's authority. So let not your experience be your teacher. <clears throat> this is another, another uh, thing that we go through, that, that uh, uh, let experience be your teacher. I get it, I get it to a point, experience helps not to do what not to do, maybe. But God has given us an opportunity for us to be trained and be taught differently. So instead of learning the experience, I mean like for me, this is how I look at it. If you can't even learn it from your experience, it's tough. It's tough for you because you failed that five times and you didn't even learn that. You got divorced five times and you still didn't learn it. There is something wrong there that we have to learn. Even in that experience part. And then, okay, I don't want to let the experience teach me. Okay, then let's learn from the teacher. And the other problem that happens with experience is just because I'm experiencing tough time doesn't give me any right to say God is bad. This age-old stupid question, if God is so good, how can there be evil? That's one of the most dumbest questions you will come across. God never said, I am only good. One thing. And two, God didn't even say that all of these things are consequences of me. So, but anyway, while we are imposing uh, God's sovereignty, we forget the limitations of that sovereignty. But anyway, today it is not that study we are going after. But I want us to understand this authority today as a body of Christ, as a body. So John, 1 John 5, 4. 1 John 5, 4 reads like this. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Whatever. What a blank check right there. God puts it so blank right there, anything can qualify for that. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Are you born of God? Yeah. If you are born of God, what are you supposed to be? Overcome, overcome. Why, why is offense overcoming you? Why is hurt overcoming you? Why is bitterness overcoming you? I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not asking for you to give me an answer, but I'm asking you to understand your position. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. What is it? Our faith. Our faith. There is a wonderful tool 
that has been given to us by God himself saying, okay, use this tool for your overcoming reasons. If you ever want to overcome, I know we can do it on our own. But he says, okay, if you, are, if you are of me, you are bound to overcome. But for you to overcome, use this tool of faith. Because it is the only thing that can overcome the world. Not your will, not your determination, none of those things. But it is your faith. It is your faith that overcomes the world. I want you to understand the standards are not according to the people's definition, but the definition of God himself. Should I overcome this or not? Should be defined by him. Amen? Amen. Then he has to define sin. That's when we can overcome sin. Otherwise, if we don't define, if, you, if we don't go by his definition, there is no reason for us to overcome. There is no reason for us to use our faith. As long as I am appropriating sin or appropriating anything that is not of God, I will never overcome it. There is no reason for me to overcome it. Because I'm looking for an appropriation. I try to appropriate it. I try to make it feel good. You know, many times I do, I do that. I do it for myself and the Holy Spirit has to convict. Some of us have, come, have gone too far from the conviction of the Holy Spirit because we have been sedated. We have come to a place of saturation that even the Holy Spirit can convict you. Or we have gone so deep on the, uh, on the other side. Like say, for example, we talk about addictions. Somebody who has been addicted so much, no matter how much they are helped, they still roll back. They still go back and fall back. Why? Because the power of addiction is controlling them. And you have not come to a place of overcoming, which is our faith. We have not built our faith to overcome. Faith has to be built. Remember the word of God says, faith comes by hearing, by hearing the word of God. If you don't have that faith, there is no way you can overcome. You know, I can preach all I want. I can pray all I want. It is again that person's faith that overcomes. Not your prayer. I want you to remember that. When we are interceding for others. What do we do when we are interceding? We are supporting him. Are supporting her for their faith war. Now let's go with me to the book of Matthew, 28th chapter, 16th verse. Starting at 16. Matthew 28, starting at 16. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Well, you know, why would they doubt him? Think about that. I've, I've heard me many times, we go through, I go through the challenge of doubting. Many times I go through the challenge of doubting. Why would I doubt? Because I doubted in the beginning. Every opportunity God gives, you have to take an opportunity to believe. If you don't take the opportunity to believe, you will end up, believe, you will end up doubting. Why we call him Doubting Thomas? When he was given an opportunity to believe, he chooses to doubt. And then it manifests all the way to the end. But one revelation from God changed him and he goes to the places that no man thought would possible, be possible to go. And he goes and preaches the gospel there. But anyway, here, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, look at this, all authority has been given to me. All authority has been given to me. Jesus is talking about his authority. Now look at this, in heaven and on earth, all authority, there is nobody or nothing else have more authority than Jesus. Can somebody say amen? amen. Nobody has authority over heaven or over earth than Jesus. Because Jesus has all authority. You might think 
that has authority. You might think the other thing might have authority, but I want you to know there is someone who has who is above that. That one person that is above that is Jesus. I want us to understand that, that I'm not trying to say there is nobody that has authority around. They have authority. The principalities and the powers, they exercise their authority. But I want you to understand, we have an access to the CEO. Yes. We have an access to the CEO. If you have an access to the CEO, there may be a manager here who is trying to offend you or stop you. Now what do you do? You use the authority from the person that has all authority. Are you with me here? Yes. So all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. If you are dealing with any affair that is connected with heaven or on earth, there is someone that has all authority. That is Jesus. Right? right? right. Now what, he, what is he saying? 19th verse. 19th verse, what is he saying? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is delegation. What Jesus is doing here is he is delegating his authority to his disciples. He says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, now look at this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Amen. Now look at it. He was delegating. And he was giving them the task of what needs to be done. While he is also giving them the assurance I'm with you. Many times, uh, uh, you know very well, when you have worked in an office system, if you ask someone to do something, they wouldn't do it. But if you tell them the boss man asked you to do it, what they do? do They'll do it. Now there is the same psychology here, same understanding here. There are many things that, that they, they don't obey to us, that they, would, they wouldn't let us do us, but that's why Jesus says, in my name. Okay. In my name because he's got the authority over it. Yeah. Why are you asking me to flee? Remember the, the demon asks this, this guy in the book of Acts, uh, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? Now the same uh, authority transfer, same delegation. Let's read it from another gospel which is Mark chapter 16 starting at verse 14. Mark 16 starting at verse 14. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart. Are you ready for this? Are you ready for this? Jesus was not being nice. Let me be very clear to you. Jesus is not known for being nice. Though we impute him for that. We are always looking for nice. Nice, let's be nice, let's be nice. Let me show, let me, I, I'm, I'm still looking for, I've been studying the Bible for, a, for the longest. Let me see somewhere where it says, let me be nice. Where I am commanded to be nice. Now I want you to understand, it is nowhere trying to tell you, you shouldn't be kind. Wholesome words ought to be coming out of us. If you are trying to get your way by your cackling, you're worth nothing. That's not what, 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 what I'm talking about. I'm talking about something that we are trying to make Jesus look like that he is not. And look at this thing. Why I'm saying this is because we are not ready for a rebuke from Jesus. We are not ready for a rebuke from Jesus. Now let me, uh, let me ask you, let me test you something here. Well, well, were you okay with someone's, someone else's rebuke in your life? If we can't handle a human rebuke, how do you think you're going to handle God's rebuke? 
And again, rebuke is not about yelling. Rebuke is about correction according to the truth. But Jesus immediately, as soon as he comes, he, he rebuked their unbelief and the hardness of heart. Because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Think about that. Think about that for a moment. He was rebuking them because they did not believe some other, some other person's record. And he said to them, now, now he goes on, the authority has been given, now he is giving the, the commission here. He's going after the great commission that we talk about, or I'd like to call it as the delegation. He is delegating to, saying, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Every creature. Can we say every creature? Every. It's not about a man thing. Everything that has life. That's why we sing the song, let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Come on. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Everything that has breath needs to know about this gospel. Because all creation is waiting for the manifestation of his sons. That's true. All creation. And that also gives you the reason to believe that gospel is not always about making, oh, come to Jesus, let me talk to you about Jesus. That's not it. Your lifestyle alone. There were more people converted. There were more people that were healed when Peter was just walking. He wasn't stopping and ministering to them or he wasn't doing anything. They just came and touched the hem of his garment. Boom, they're healed. I mean, not even the hem of his garment. He touched, the, they touched his shadow. Now he says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. Look at this. Your condemnation is already with you if you don't believe. Uh, uh, maybe a side note. You can only be condemned if you don't believe. Condemnation can only prevail in us if we don't believe. Think about that. Anytime you are con you, you, you're going through condemnation, I want you to remember you're a believer. Let faith, let, let faith arise. When you let faith come out, the condemnation will also come down. Now what does he say? And these signs will follow those who believe. Now what is he talking about? He's talking about the authority. He's talking about the transfer. He's talking about the end results. What are, what are the things that are going to come from this? In my name they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, Anything deadly. Think about that. Anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. It will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Recover is a good word to remember. As a young believer, I have offended many believers. Because I would blame them for their not, not, for them not healing. You didn't have enough faith to be healed. If it is you, I ask you to repent. Repent of that. That's not of God. God gives an opportunity for recovery. When you have released your faith, it goes through the motion. It goes through the notion, let it go through it. Don't try to offend others. It is not our job to offend others. It is not our job to keep pounding on them. You have to do this. You have to do that. 
No, it's none of your none of your business. Let me. Can I, if nobody told you this, let me be the person telling you this. You think your words can convict that person? If God can convict that person, can you convict them? So maybe if we keep doing that, it might bring condemnation into their lives than conviction. So instead of that, let us be somebody that edifies. Let us be somebody. That's why that this is where an experience with God helps you. My sister, I've been there too. I walked like this too. I was waiting for a miracle for my seven years. And I was going through this. That's what, that's where it becomes the living epistle. You become the living letter that people can read. Otherwise, what you're bringing is condemnation, not conviction. Not conviction. There may be a time and time you have to talk. I get it. But I want us to remember this thing. That we are in the business of recovery. We are in the business of recovery. And let us stick to it. Instead of trying to, I blame them. Oh, you didn't have enough faith. They would just look at me like, like this. I had faith. God rest, Jesus respected the woman with two mites. That's her faith. Mm -hmm. Jesus respected that. So let us not be somebody who condemns them. Instead, appreciates them. Thank you. I think it's a great honor. I mean, like, I have seen so much. But I can appreciate, I'm so, it takes a lot for you to believe, even when who, your whole body is telling you that you can't do this. And what am I doing? I'm coming from a point of faith, I know, knowing that God ha, God's healing is already available for that person. I'm encouraging that person to walk into it instead of trying to condemn that person. That's why the Bible talks about soft answer. Soft answers. Now I'm going to go to another place here. Matthew 18, starting at verse 15. Remember, I'm still doing the, the, the preparation. This is an introduction. Let's, let's go for the introduction. This is all the authority. This is the delegation part I'm talking about. Once we get into the delegation part, we will understand the next. We will understand our position. The book of Ephesians is all about your position. When we understand, when we know, most of us know we have been given authority. We have the authority, but we never understood how to position. The book of Ephesians provides us a roadmap or a help for our position. Moreover, this is Jesus talking, Matthew 18, starting, starting at 15th verse. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, look at this, that is kind of like it's a lost art these days. We don't talk to that person about their mistake. Instead, we talk to the whole world. We talk to everybody but that person. Many times that breaks my heart. That breaks my heart. If my son is going to, uh, going to tell somebody that I hurt, hurt him, that will break my heart. Because I like for my son to come to me. Daddy, you hurt me. I think, I think we, we are missing on that opportunity also where we are not being honest with our brother. Where we can talk to them privately and tell, okay, this is something seems like this may have crossed the line. Him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take, uh, uh, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. Well, he's giving us a road map of how to deal. How to deal with our brothers. 
And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. Then escalation. He's giving us a point of escalation. But if he refuses even to hear to the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Without you going through this notion, you cannot tell them he is no longer my brother. Surely, now he goes on something here. Surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now he's talking about the brothers, and now he's talking about heaven and earth binding. Because there is a connection and a connectivity between our relationships. This is all part of our authority. If we don't gain an understanding of our authority, we might end up not being helpful for each other as brethren. This is about profit or loss. Can I be profitable into my brother's life? Instead, we are all looking at what can I get from that person. Our mindset should be different. Our mindset should be, how can I be profitable to my brother? What can I bring to him, bring to her, that can edify that person, that can profit that person? That is brotherhood. That is being the body. And because of that, you have gained an authority. It says, whatever you bind on this earth will be bound in heaven. Think about that, that, that uh, how, how wonderful it is. That, that something that you can bind on this earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on this earth will be lose in heaven. When you go through this notion, you will be given an opportunity Amen. by God. You'll be given an opportunity by God himself where you can come to a place. I'm no longer... I'm connected with this person. I can't let the blessing come in. I can't do that. I tried. I wrestled. I did everything. Again, I say to you that if, you know, even in this, this notion can be applied into marriage. You know, these days we see they are too quick to get married and they are too quick to get separated. Have we done what this notion said? Have we talked with each other? Then if there was no conviction there, have we gone to two or three people? Then if that didn't work, have we gone to the church? But again, to their defense, I can tell, the society out there is so much corrupted, even the church is so corrupted, that we don't have the, the views of, of, of Jesus Christ. The mindset of Christ has not been uh, uh, promoted in us so much. So we have to come to this place. Uh, that's one of the reasons for us to understand what it is to be the body of Christ. So we may be there for each other. You know, we say all the time, strength in numbers. How can you give the strength when we can't have each other's back? When we can't do that. That's why authority and position goes hand in hand. You may have the authority many times. Many people don't like to work for a manager because you know, they have the authority but ne they never have the position. Because you know they are the first to run. They are the first to throw you under the bus. That's why you don't have predominantly, usually we don't have respect for the leadership. But we can be the other way, right? Can I be that person that can give that support for that person? Many times you're looking for your position to define you. But Jesus is here trying to transform you to a place where you have the authority in heaven and earth. Now you act as one.
Now he goes 19 to verse. Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. I am there in the midst of them. What a great comfort for us. Don't you want Jesus to be with you all the time? If you really want Jesus to be with you all the time, follow this principle that God has set in motion. Where two or three gathered in my name. That is position. It is not about just gathering here in a presence and saying, Oh, we are here, Lord, two or three people. It's not about the body count. It's about the position. So now, keeping all of this in mind, we have authority. Jesus has given a delegation to us. We have been delegated. We have been given the authority by Jesus clearly says, I have given you authority. You can even cast demons. Think about that. You have been given authority to cast demons. If you look at that profile, when you get into a job, you you know, first time when I moved away from uh, uh, from a smaller job to a bigger job, uh, they say, okay, you get paid paid vacation. I'm like, okay, what do I do with my vacation? I don't even know how 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 the vacation accrual works or what not. I don't know all those things, but the difference that makes is about how you position them. You have the authority to make certain changes. You have the authority to do these kinds of things. But when you have the authority and don't have the understanding of the position. Now look at this. One of the things, one of the, one of the things that goes out right now about, the, uh, uh, about our current president is he has the authority, but is he in charge? That is one of the things that goes on because some of the actions or the things that happen are, doesn't, doesn't look like he is acting as an in charge. He seems like he's acting as someone is telling him what to do and he does it. And that, that is not how authority works. That is not how authority should work. When you have been given the authority, you have to be the one making the decisions. Many times when we see the leaders that are not acting uh, according to their authority, you have the right to give me promotion, why are you not? Because they are not taking their position. They are not being in charge. The same thing is true with the body of Christ. You have the authority. Are you acting as an in charge? That makes the difference between a slave and an owner. Are we still acting as servants or are we acting as the people with authority or owners? Okay. Servant is always looking to clock out. Servant is always looking to clock out. Whereas the owner, he's always looking to close. How can I close this? Amen. Amen. So that's the difference we, I want us to gain today. What is our position? What is the description of our authority? We have the authority. We talk about, oh, Christian, I have authority. I have authority. You know I have authority. Anytime we talk about authority, we just puff up. We think we are the best thing on this earth. Oh, we got this. We got this. No, you don't. That's why most of the, 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 the that's why most of the people that are in leadership fail. They have the, the authority, but they never understood positioning. They never understood their position, the description of their job. You know, we we for our for a, a, a visual example, 
But this uh, uh, nation, either you have a president who is a Republican or a Democrat. But when he becomes, or he or she becomes the president, that person is the president of the United States of America, not a particular party. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The difference of the position. But anyway, um, uh, coming to the book of Ephesians, I just want to read this thing quickly. We are going to come back to it. I'm not going to start anything today. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God the Father and the uh, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself according to the good pleasure of His will, to the praise of the glory of His grace, by which He made us accepted and beloved, you haven't become accepted and beloved just because you're pretty self. But because of all the other things that are there. Now the seventh verse reads like this. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Having made known to us the mystery of his will. His will is the secret here. According to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of what? His will. Again his will comes here. That he who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of His glory. Now look at this. Holy Spirit is a guarantee. He is the guarantee card. I want, don't forget Holy Spirit as much as we look for the Holy Spirit in other aspects. I want us to also look at Him. This is my guarantee. If the Holy Spirit is here, I am guaranteed a birth in heaven. It's a guarantee of, of our inheritance. Therefore, 15th verse, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul is praying for them. What is that? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. He is not talking about giving you wealth, giving you riches, giving you that, giving you all those things. But instead He says, may give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of His calling. His calling is your, is your delegation. What have you been delegated to? If you really want to know what have you been delegated to, you have to be enlightened in the knowledge of His will. 
What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? Again, who believe? You are coming back into that same bucket. He is bringing all of them to that bucket of believers. According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Now look, when Jesus was talking about our authority in the Gospels, he is talking about what is fixing to happen based off of that. Whereas when Paul is explaining to us our position, he was talking about what Jesus had already ex uh, accomplished in the cross. He gives us all the understanding which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Some of us might even ask a question. What is, what is a guarantee that he is in the heavenly places? Remember Jesus rebuked the daughter. <laughs> For above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come. In other words, Paul was explaining to us, Paul was explaining to us about the authority that Jesus have gained. There Jesus was proclaiming about his authority versus Paul was saying X, Y, Z have happened. Now he has the authority. He's giving us the evidence. Rock solid evidence. If you believe that Jesus Christ have been resurrected, then there is that, that should be an evidence for us. That we have been positioned to walk in that authority. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Again, he's bringing back to the body. The body. The body. He's bringing us back to that place. The body. You know, right now, many of them, oh, that is for the disciples. There are people, in, uh, the people that believe that authority is only for the, for the, for the, uh, for the 12 or the, for the apostles or not. No, 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 it is for the body. It is for the body. That is what he is trying to explain to us here. He's trying to give us and give us a revelation, give us an understanding of our positioning. How you and me can position so we may also operate in the authority that God has given us. Amen. So I'm gonna, uh, have, I have a few statements to make here. A delegation with no authority cannot bring results. Whenever you are delegating certain things, whenever you are calling for, for uh, a healing or calling for some, some evil spirit to be bound or what not, that's a delegation. And if, if there is no authority involved with it, it cannot bring results. And the same thing is also true when we are being delegated, you cannot bring results without an authority. You got to have authority. A difference between an owner and a servant is very clear in results. You will see them in results. When the end result comes, you know who have done it. Amen? Amen. If you give it to a servant, he'll just do it. But if you give it to an owner, he'll do it to make sure everything is covered. A rightful owner. Right. An increase in the knowledge of his will ought to be desired by every believer. Let us, let us uh, 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 put our focus on, hey, let us uh, increase in the knowledge of his will. Let us desire for that. Let me increase in the knowledge of his will. 
And then a believer's authority is completely dependent on the knowledge of his will. Without you knowing his will, let me tell you, you don't have any authority. Because you can't back your authority. That's why knowledge of his will is what gives you the positioning. Even though you have the authority, your positioning is dependent on the understanding of your authority. You know, it kind of reminds me of that story um, uh, uh, that I watched uh, um, long back when the, all of mankind uh, got some sort of a virus and uh, uh, this one guy who was a uh, a uh, 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 military army uh, um, doctor, he claims that to be his, uh, his ground zero and he doesn't give up on that ground and he says I'm gonna find a cure for this I'm gonna find a cure for this and he fights and he fights day in and day out figuring out a solution for it because he positioned himself he knew his authority, so he positioned himself. And because of that, he was able to find a solution in that movie. But anyway, but which is so true here, when we don't understand how you can position. What is your position? It is all about positioning. Opportunity comes your way if we don't understand how to position ourselves. Your opportunity will go in vain. Opportunity goes for waste. I mean, the best example about opportunity and positioning is, is you can learn it from the story of Esther. Once in a lifetime opportunity to become a queen. And all she does was she just positions herself. She goes through a preparation and positions herself rightly. And when she does that, she got the promotion. Amen? Amen. And not only that, even after that, Mordecai pushes her, maybe for a time like this. Isn't that what 